Y'all better stop me now before I start singing Defying Gravity at this moment because the Epipa vibes are real. Hello my fellow gods and goddesses, welcome back to my channel, my name is Heather and today we are going to be talking about famous western mythological witches. <laughs> the Witchathon Readathon is happening and that is a Witchathon hosted by Crescent Moon Reads aka Rhiannon. It's basically a Readathon surrounding the Sabbaths of Wicca. Um, I don't think she does all of the Sabbaths. I think she only does half of them but either way I am participating in this Readathon of Astara and I thought, well, since I'm doing the readathon, I should do like a witchy inspired video. So that's what we're gonna do today. I have gathered up five famous mythological witches and I figured I could talk to you guys about them. I just want a video on non-Western witches or non-Western goddesses, gods, anything like that. I definitely want to do that because I think non-western mythologies and non-western stories in general just are very underappreciated so if you guys want that let me know but let's just get started the first which i'm going to talk about is circe of course i can't start a witch related video without talking about the first goddess of sorcery which is Circe. So let me just go through a quick biography of Circe. So Circe is the daughter of Helios who is the titan god of the sun and the nymph Perseia who is one of the Oceaneids. Uh, other accounts also say that she is the daughter of Hecate who is the technically the goddess of sorcery. I refer to her more as the goddess of the hearth. That was just more of what she was worshipped as by the Greeks. So I don't necessarily attribute to sorcery to Hecate all that much, though it's still definitely an attribute for her. But anyways, that's a tangent. But Homer, who is the writer of the Odyssey, accounts her as the daughter of Helios and the daughter of Perseia. And she is a nymph technically due to her lineage. She has a knack for pharmaca, which is the ancient Greek word for sorcery, magic, things of that nature, and she is caught by Zeus doing some magic things that he doesn't really like because in the ancient world the gods were the only ones with power and the birth of pharmaca by Circe kind of instigated this newly found power that the gods very much feared. So Zeus basically told Helios, he was like, listen, you gotta get your daughter in check. You gotta do something about her. So he siles Circe to Aia or Aia. There are so many vowels in that word. It is a crime. She further develops her craft so you know as is the irony of Greek stories it kind of made it worse. Regardless she is able to perfect her craft in solitude uh, and she basically becomes eventually her exile turns into kind of a uh, adoption agency for all the uh, illegitimate nymphs of the Greek gods which you think there's if you think there's a lot of demigods out there, there are even more nymphs. But regardless, she is on this island. She's got her nymphs. She's she's chilling. She's straight chilling, doing her magic. But of course, as is the nature of men, they want the coochie. Circe is very much known for her uh, revenge against men, and one of the most famous cases of this is of course with Odysseus. It's when he comes to Aia and she basically turns all of her men to pigs. We then knew. Hermes, you know, kind of takes Odysseus to the side and is like, hey, you need to keep this flower so you become her lover instead. Uh, Odysseus ends up being Circe's lover. They end up having three kids, I believe, but one of their sons ends up being Telegonus, not to be confused with Odysseus' legitimate son, Telemachus, and Telegonus actually ends up killing 
Odysseus. So that's just a short little brief history of Circe. Now let's just take a quick segue into a person literally related to Circe and that is beautiful wicked Medea. Medea is probably my absolute favorite Greek play. It's by Euripides. If you guys haven't read it, I highly recommend it. I remember reading it in high school and it was so brutal and murderous and dark. It's, it's a tragedy and it truly is a tragedy and it's amazing. Medea is actually related to Circe because she is the granddaughter of Helios and uh, Circe is actually Medea's aunt. So because of that lineage, Medea has this knack for pharmaca, aka magic, and she is very much a sorceress. Medea is a princess who actually helps Jason, who if you don't know, Jason and the Argonauts, he's the one who, you know, got the Golden Fleece. And Medea actually directly helps Jason get the Golden Fleece in exchange for a marriage proposal. And Jason follows through with it. He gets the fleece, he gets all that. And another segue to that is Medea, her father actually hated Jason, didn't want her to help him, but she did it anyways because we gotta do what we gotta do for the dick, okay? She ends up actually capturing her brother killing him, chopping him up in little pieces, putting him out into the sea so the their, his fa her father's ship could come collect the pieces and have time for Medea and Jason to escape. Uh, she does the same process to her own father when Jason wants his father to live longer, so she kills her father, chops him up into little pieces, puts him in a cauldron, and adds life to Jason's father. So, basically, um, Star Wars is shaking. Um, they could never, and if you think your family is bad, well, at least there isn't too much dismembering. Hopefully. Things get worse when Jason decides to leave Medea. Now, I don't exactly know what the mindset of Jason was when he witnessed his wife brutally chop up both her brother and her father and decides, hmm, you know what, I uh, I need some new coochie. So I'm gonna leave her and it's gonna be fine. Even the Greeks knew men were stupid. So know your history, folks. So yeah, it doesn't go well, as you may expect, when Jason tries to leave Medea. Medea exiled through Jason's new father-in-law and but he gives her one day to until she has to leave and in that one day she manages to poison both Jason's new princess her father kills both of her sons and yeah so moral of the story is just respect your women and you won't have any problems so the next sorceress we are going to be talking about is morgan le fay she is a figure of arthurian legends which let me just tell you studying arthurian legends is a struggle it is so convoluted and there's so much that is it canon and you can't just and it's so hard to distinguish canon from fan fiction because actually if you guys didn't know lancelot is actually a figure of fan fiction it actually wasn't canon uh but that's another that's another discussion for another day uh, but Morgan Le Fay is sometimes Arthur's lover, sometimes uh, Arthur's half-sister, she's sometimes a queen's entirely unrelated to Arthur, but in this, in this instance we are going to go with she is Arthur's half-sister. Morgan Le Fay, she was betrothed to this dude and she just wasn't feeling it. She didn't want it. She was just not, she was like, hmm. I don't know about that one chief so she decides that instead of marrying this dude that she doesn't even like she's gonna you know just like have some fun sleep 
sleep around, go wild. She's in her early, she, she's in her teens. She's just gonna, she's just gonna have fun. And we just love a feminist icon. Who's gonna blame her? While she is just having a grand old time, getting her fill, literally, Guinevere, Arthur's wife, she, she pops in and she finds out and she's like the buzzkill of the century. She is the original cock blocker. And she's like, nah, nah, bitch, you need to chill and close your legs, which is truly ridiculous considering her adventures that we all know about. And this is basically the start of Morgan and Guinevere's rivalry. She decides that she's just going to make her and Arthur's life a living hell, which honestly, same goes on to a whole bunch of drama about her trying to kill Arthur, trying to steal Excalibur, just a whole bunch of court intrigue and manipulation and all that jazz. She is extremely smart. She studied under Merlin. She's just basically spent her days just learning the evilest, darkest, and most effective magic spells because she got cock blocked but in the end she ends up just disappearing out of nowhere arthur's like oh shit is she dead miss kisa oh my fucking god she fucking dead she's not gone she's actually having a grand old time in some castle she's straight chilling she is reading some cookbooks she's petting some cats she's just laying in her silk sheets with a face mask she's got some lip balm she's straight chilling she is a reformed woman she's like you know what i'm done with you and your wife y'all can do whatever the hell you want i'm gonna work on me so not only has she sustained being the first cock block experience of history he has invented self-care and i just i just love her for that um and she actually as her last act of a redemption arc she actually is the first sorceress to send Arthur off to Avalon. You know what? She just went some rebellious teen years. She had a breakdown and then she got her, she made herself into a better person. And I just, we love that. We love her icon. All right. The next sorceress, which I will be talking about is one that you absolutely cannot say the word witch without thinking of without giving credit to and that is the beautiful mystic old dangerous child eating baba yaga she is a slavic witch who lives in a house with chicken legs on the bottom so it can easily transportation and i just queen of efficiency she is very much a figure of nightmares for children uh, it is said multiple, multiple times that she will eat the children who run off into the woods. Honestly, I can't blame her. Could you imagine being in your, your home secluded in the forest with your human bone fence and your chicken legged house and you see these nasty ass kids just walking up to your house, poking at your skulls on your fence and just, just like, just being gross and loud and annoying as our children would you do you blame her for committing acts of cannibalism i can't entirely write that off on the flip side she is also very much a wise seer and a figure of wisdom but it is also said that each question she answers she gets another or she ages a whole year so that's partly attributed to why she is often depicted as an older woman and also she her sons are the three horsemen so that's pretty sick oh and another title which i love she is titled as the devil's grandmother and i don't know about you but i'll take my chances with the devil i ain't gonna mess with the devil's grandma like no nah, we gonna let baba yaga be all right and the last figure of sorcery we will be talking about is one that i don't know too much about because Norse mythology is so confusing and the the language and the pronunciation and everything is just too much for my head. I don't know what the hell the Vikings... Okay, no, I, I actually now that I think about it, 
the behavior of the Vikings and what they did relate, ext make extreme sense when looking at their language. It actually is quite alarming. We are going to be talking about Grimhild. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation, but again, we're going to move on. Is a queen and a sorceress. Grimhild is a lot like Hera in a way. She gives me a lot of Hera vibes. She very much cares about the success of her lineage, especially through her, like through her children. She very much cares about her children getting success regardless of how that has to happen. So by whatever means necessary, she is the Norse mythological Kris Jenner. Uh, she gets involved with Sigurd, who is just um, another Norse hero. We won't get into his story because whatever, who cares? Men are trash. Sigurd is in love with the Valkyrie Brynhild, but that doesn't work for Grimhild's agenda. It just, it doesn't work. So instead, she drafts a potion of forgetfulness to Sigurd to make sure he forgets of all about Brimhild. Like, nah, she, you don't like her. We're moving on. Because she wants Sigurd to marry her daughter. So that's, that, that's basically happens. And then as a flip side to that, she not only wants Sigurd to marry her daughter, but she wants her son to marry Brimhild. Because if her daughter marries a Norse hero, unification, and her son marries a Valkyrie, unification, earth, sky, babies, power, legitimacy, basic math. I'm not a family person, but I can appreciate a mother who drugs a man to further her own agenda. I'm going to hell. At least I won't have to deal with the devil's grandmother. All right, guys, so that's the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed me kind of retelling a few famous sorceresses in mythological history. Let me know down below how you guys are going on Witchathon, if you guys are participating, how many books you've read, if you've been procrastinating like me, let me know, let me know. Let's, let's share this moment together. And I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.